So my name is Mitchell and I've, I build UIs with JavaScript now for a living, which is awesome. I uh, used to be a full stack developer and, and now I get to build UIs with Ember all day, which is pretty cool. Um, I do some trainings too. I've uh, taught trainings at four uh, different companies and I actually partnered with Tilda to make an online training that's been delivered to exactly 400 people when I last checked. I'm sure nobody shared or pirated anything, so that's an exact number. Um, I am an independent contractor, so I'm hireable. I had to look up how to spell hireable, so I don't know if that says anything. Uh, but no, not a great speller. So this is what I want to talk about. Uh, th this is kind of the outline of the talk. First, I'm going to talk about like mental models in the physical world, and then how that might tie into mental models and programming. And then I'm just going to run through Ember at a very high level, hopefully not too much syntax, and just talk about you know, what my mental models are and what I like to teach. Hopefully, if you're new, uh, you'll, you'll learn something, and if you're really experienced with Ember, maybe it'll adjust or maybe you'll disagree, but uh, it should be interesting. So here's the first one. You're, you're driving a motorcycle. So I feel like I need to turn this way so I'm facing the same way as, as you guys here. And <clears throat> you've got a turn signal that goes up and down on your motorcycle. And I'll give you a little more context here. It's on the left side. It's on your left handlebar and it goes up or down. And now you're, you need to make a left hand turn and you need to decide which way are you going to turn this turn signal so that you're making a legal turn. So any guesses on that? I don't know. Down, up, up, down, left, right. So here's one possible mental model. Let's, we're on the left side of the stick, right? So let's push the left switch forward because we're going to go left. Uh, but that's actually not right. Here is the actual mental model for, for this particular story, which is from the design of everyday things, which is the writer finally realized that the way he, he modeled it was that if he's going to turn right, the handlebar on the left is going to go forward. So he'll flick that switch, and then that's the way he's going to turn. And conversely, if he's going to turn left, same sort of thing. You're going to go this way, so flick it left, and then turn. And so once having this mental model, all of a sudden it's really easy to sort of, as soon as you've locked that in, now it might feel obvious, or if you do it a couple times, uh, it's probably going to be easier to remember. Oh yeah, so that's the answer. It's right and left. You might think, why not just make it left and right? That's called a natural mapping. Be a little more obvious. Uh, I think that's the way most of them actually are. So the point here is that adjusting our mental model can make ambiguous interfaces uh, a little more clear. So let's talk a little about programming, right? Because some of us program here. Uh, Ember Data. I, I've been working a lot recently with Ember Data. And this is sort of the mental model I started with, which is this. I get a payload from my server, right? You don't need to read that. Uh, and what Ember Data does in my mind is it goes to this payload and it finds these keys and like shoves them in my models, right? So here I've got a person, a post, and some comments. And let's say I've got like an API like most companies have, which is like nested information. Probably most people are not actually working with JSON APIs. And I've got articles here. So I know that I've got the DS embedded records mixin, which is awesome for this. I say, okay, I've got an attribute that's articles, and that's always embedded, whether I serialize or deserialize. Great. Everything's great. Problem is, let's say I've got a little bit of a, a mismatch. My model is post, but my information is articles. So using my mental model, I'm thinking, okay, find the payload key articles and then put that in my model named post. And I look at this and I think, okay, attributes, articles. Well, yeah, articles still are embedded. So, you know, when the serializer goes through and it sees articles, it should put them into post. How do I tell it to put it into post? And if I start, you know, doing what every good uh, Ember data developer does is start reading the source code. And eventually uh, come upon a, a hook that looks something like this, key for relationship. So in this case, I'm a little confused because like, what key am I looking for? My relationship, I suppose, is posts. And this takes a key, and then it's going to like return a key. I, this didn't quite comport, right? So what if I, I took this mental model and kind of switched it on its head and said, all right, instead of thinking about pushing all this data into my models, what if we reverse this and think about pulling the data into my models, right? Seems like what's the difference? But it is, it is quite a bit different. So now when I get a payload for a person, I'm thinking that that person model is going to have its comments like pull the information out of that payload. 
So I, I think about it like this. My person model has a posts relationship, and the payload key for posts is article. Right? So now when I look at my serializer, I can think, OK, well, my serializer is more concerned with posts. Right? If it starts with posts, that's probably what needs to be in here. I guess attributes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'll change that to posts. Now, perfect world, maybe that would be like relationships, because there is a difference between relationships and attributes. But this is an old part of Ember data. Payload key articles, that would be like a home run. I'd just be like, boom, got it. Uh, but I need to implement this key for relationship. Now this makes sense, right? I'm looking at the post relationship. What's the key? It makes a little more sense to me. I'm going to rename that uh, argument key into relationships so that I know uh, what's going on. And then when I see its posts, I return articles off to the races. So that's my new, my new mental model. Uh, for how, especially this embedded records mix and works, it actually goes through the relationships and pulls what it needs out of the payload. So now we need to talk about refrigerators. So you guys are getting too excited about all the programming. So I had to check my own refrigerator to make sure this is like still the case, because I thought this is a pretty old example. Uh, but mine still worked this way. And I think if you have the top and the bottom section refrigerator, I think yours probably works this way too. So you've got two controls, right? Perfectly logical. Like if you said design this, you'd say, all right, one control for the freezer. One control for the fresh food, that's what they call it. And you know, when you crank up the freezer, freezer gets cold. And you crank up the fresh food, fresh food gets cold. Great. So there's this little instruction sheet that goes with it. If you want normal coldness in both of them, that's C and 5, which uh -huh. makes quite a bit of sense, right? Because it's in the middle, at least. Uh, if you want your fresh food to be colder, crank the fresh food thing up to 7. All right, so now we're thinking, cool, crank up 7, awesome, more cold. Uh, I want the coldest fresh food, adjust your freezer to B, and then crank up your fresh food more to 9. If you want a colder freezer, though, turn your freezer to D, and then back your fresh food off to 7. If you want warmer fresh food, crank it down to 3, and then go back to C. At this point, it just makes no sense. right? Like, There's clearly a huge mismatch here in what's going on with these controls. And that's because they've given us a false mental model. So here is the true mental model of a refrigerator, which is that you have a thermostat. And you pick how cold you want the overall system to be. And then the second thing is just adjusting a valve that says, you know, where does that air get directed to? So all of a sudden, you can actually start to make your own uh, decisions and like figure things out. Right? If I said, OK, your refrigerator is just right, but you want your freezer to be colder, you say, OK, well, I'm going to crank up my overall coldness and then maybe divert some of that air away from my refrigerator. And we're smart enough to do that, I, I hope. Um, it just makes a, a better mental model. So I was trying to think of something sort of like this in programming. Um, uh, oh yeah, so here, yeah, a truthful mental model is always better than a simple mental model. I guess that's kind of the, the takeaway here, right? Two controls sounds good, but if, if you can't back that up with your real implementation, then it's just misleading the user. So ORMs, this was kind of, I'm not an ORM hater. Uh, I use ORMs and I like them. Uh, but here is something if you use uh, Active Record that you've probably seen before. This is straight out of the Rails guides. Looks very harmless. I get 10 clients, loop over them, show the addresses post. Congratulations, you've just created an N plus 1 query, which will pass all your tests. It will run just fine with small data sets. But when you actually go to use it in real production, you're going to have a bad time. So you know, Rails, you can fix this. You say includes addresses. And now you've, you know, behind the scenes, you've included that information that you needed. Uh, there all are alternatives to this. I've not gotten a chance to use it yet in Anger, but uh, Ruby Object Mapper is one. So it's got an idea of a relation, and it forces you to make that query up front. I want this exact query for my database. And the second piece, that as entity, is actually mapping objects onto the query that you just made. So again, it's just kind of like putting you in the mindset of what actually needs to be done when you're working with databases, which is to make a query and then map your objects to them and use them. Right? That, that whole lazy loading thing can be a little bit dangerous. So that might be a little more aligned, maybe not great for every case, but it's what I came up with. So Ember, we're at an Ember meetup. So I should talk about Ember. And, and these are sort of the, the, this is the way I think about Ember today, is, is four sort of things. And I actually saw that Trek recently had a pull request where he broke this down to three things, uh, put templating components together in the guides, and which, I mean, they're very closely aligned, makes sense. So let's quickly talk about routing here, which I think is like one of the strongest uh, places for Ember and its sort of mental design. So the whole idea of a route, if you're kind of new to Ember, or routing in general, is that I've got a URL. And based on that URL, I want to show some kind of UI on the screen. 
That's the job to be done there. So there's two pieces that need to happen before we do that. One is in the router itself, and the other one is creating the routes that will actually show that stuff on the page. So the router, if you're familiar with Ember, it's basically a DSL to map that path in the URL to a series of objects that are called routes. I find I have a lot of success when I tell server-side developers that they're like controllers, because really they are uh, quite a bit like controllers that they're used to. And then let's jump into the routes piece. Now that we've mapped those against the URL, um, we can do that great thing that Mike talked about where we just chain our model things together in serial and have a huge performance hit. Uh, and then we also get to render our templates inside of each other nested, uh, just like we put them in the router. And you've got this kind of nesting symmetry that happens, right? The router has the, the posts with show nested inside. Um, your directory structure, which is this is old school, I'm not using pods, uh, but pods would be even more obvious how this nesting occurs. And then you've got your UI where everything's nested inside of each other. There's this, this symmetry that happens with routing. Um, and before we leave, some other key points. Index is something I think that always trips people up. And the analogy I like to use is that you know, if you visit a web page and it's like mypage.html, you want a pretty URL, you can put a slash on that, you know, and, and the server will actually load index.html behind the scenes. So with Ember, it's the same if you have an empty outlet and something's missing there that it doesn't have anything to put in there, it'll just put an index. And creating links, I think people are, are pretty familiar with because most everyone's used a templating language that has something like this if they've done server-side development. So what are some issues with the mental model here? A couple that I always see is that passing, well, first of all, passing an object to link to has like really surprising results. Uh, you've probably run into this at some point in your life, where like you, you pass an object to link to, click that link, you go there, everything's great, refresh the page, everything's broken. Uh, and that happens because if you pass a model, it will actually not hit the next model route and just use that as the model, or not hit the next model hook, sorry. Uh, people hate trying to remember what model is. Uh, teaching in class and the, and the model was called movie. I think that was bad that it began with an M because everyone's just typing movie dot, movie dot, movie dot. Uh, really wishing model was named something else. And the other problem with models is that people don't realize that a model can have many things in it. If you want to pass lots of stuff to your uh, template, it makes sense to put it all in the model, but it's just a horrible name for it. So the great news is, is that there's the, uh, the routable components RFC, and this will soon be fixed. Uh, the new hook will be called attributes, which makes a lot more sense, right? Okay, that implies you can send many things to the template. And now people can name their you know, thing they're sending like attributes.movie, and, and they don't need to get hung up on that. And also, we, it will get hit every time. We'll, we'll no longer have this weird different behavior, uh, depending on whether you pass an ID or an object to link to. So that's awesome. Routing, always a super strong part of Ember, and I feel like the mental model there is, is really great. So let's get into components and templates. Uh, templates first. Templates, people usually have a pretty good time with. It's like string interpolation, right? I say, hello, Mitch. I put something in there with angle brackets and, or uh, curly brackets, and then it just gets put in there, right? That's simple. You can do this great stuff now, like just put it into a, a source attribute, which, I mean, this used to be kind of hard. We used to use bind adder. It was a different kind of syntax that we had to do. Uh, HTML properties, like who cares? It's all attributes, great. We'll just say uh, disabled equals, and HTML bars will figure out what to do, do the right thing, take off disabled if it's false, add disabled if it's there, great. This idea of interpolating, having a, a helper that returns something, people are also on board, makes sense with the model we've built up. Um, action save, a little weird because we're just kind of putting it in the middle of that tag somewhere. Like what happened to the equal sign? Well, oh, there it is. All right, on click. So that's a, a thing that we can uh, do now. Is if we use these action helpers, we can. Oh, it got darker. All right. Uh, uh, oh, it came back on. All right. So yeah, we can do this with our action helpers now, and then everyone's back on board. If helpers, each helpers, people use templating. They got open and closed tags like HTML. That's great. Uh, and the kind of the template mental model I hear is that a template is a pure function of state. So if I've got state, I run it through my template, I see this DOM, change the state, run it through the template, new DOM, great. Uh, and that is, that is a good mental model, but there are some issues that arise there. For instance, one I ran into recently is let's say we're making a checkbox and we like to have that checkbox be checked when uh, it's included in a collection, like an array. So we've got a list of 
selected groups, and when my group is in there, I want to have that thing be checked. Great. Uh, so we'll use this awesome new uh, helper syntax, which is really great, and we'll use some lodash, and we'll just make a helper to quickly take includes and make it into a, a template helper. And like a good Ember developer, we will call push object on our selected groups because we know calling push is not a good thing. And you go and you click that checkbox, and what happens? It doesn't change at all. It just is like frozen. And people are like, why did you break checkboxes? How does Ember work? The problem here is that we're actually sort of sailing on a sea of mutation. Um, we've got streams in our templates that are making this all work for us. We've got observers, which we should never, ever use. We now have stateful helpers, which use observers, if you want to have stateful helpers. And we've got uh, computed properties, which you know, are much better than using observers, but you know, they still rely on an observation. So we've got a choice to make. Uh, we could go for the brand new uh, stateful helper syntax. Uh, we could use observes and recompute when that array changes using uh, that key array brackets. Or we could go the other route and say, all right, forget that mutation. Let's just like replace the entire array. And in this case, uh, I kind of like the second option a little bit, actually. Just keeping things a little more in line with that mental model that a template is a pure function. And unless there's some kind of performance issues, maybe step away from all those things that, uh, that do observation and push object and stuff. Uh, definitely something to try. So going right into components, similar thing. This is like the famous data down actions up. Pass some attributes in, that's the data going down. I could have, I guess, drawn it going up. That would have been really confusing, but I didn't. And then the state can call callbacks to send actions up to their parents. So if you are an Ember developer, I guess you should know that Ember is uh, probably pretty solidly like third in terms of the major frameworks out there. So if you're going to run into some developers, they're probably going to be Angular and React developers, so we need to explain to them how components work. For React people, we can tell them that attributes are like props. Uh, that should make sense to them, hopefully. Uh, and then properties are a component are like state. So they've got state and they use set state, but all of our state is like actually properties on the component. For Angular 2 people, I'm not as sure because I haven't really used Angular 2, uh, but uh, I see that they've got properties that come into their components and those are for us namespace under adders, where it's for them it's actually on their components. And we're going to have to tell them not to forget to use set because they have uh, some change uh, observation stuff that they do that doesn't require getting set. And for people that aren't into a framework, we can tell them things like, all right, it's like HTML, right? You got your source attribute, you, you pass something in, you've got an event, and again, you can just pass something in. It could look like this, my image source, send it something, and then on load, uh, send it a callback that it can call. And just like HTML where we can nest it, we can do that too with our components. And then there's this other piece of HTML that is often brought up where we say, OK, if we, if we want to build HTML like a select, this is the classic example, there's some kind of hidden interaction that happens between a select and its options, right? And uh, most often, I see people try to replicate this exactly. And in Ember, we can do this with nearest of type. We can have this implicit communication between the select and the option. Uh, but the other thing we can do with Ember is uh, use yields to be a little more explicit. And I find this is just like a huge win for Ember uh, compared to the patterns I see other people using uh, in frameworks. It just makes things so testable to be able to pass in exactly what those components are going to consume. If you want to test my select without my options, that would be easy to do. Just throw something else in there. Have it call change on click or something. Uh, you could test options without the select. And testing isn't just testing, right? That means you could compose and build different systems with those same components. So uh, I think this is a pretty uh, great aspect of Ember. So the other thing we say about components is that they're isolated. What it means is you know, they only get what we send them. There's nobody just like calling methods uh, on a component willy-nilly unless you really break from the pattern. And if they need to talk to their parents, you know, again, they can call back up the chain. Uh, but these are also kind of floating on the same sea of mutation a little bit. You could do something like this. You could pass posts all the way down through your models, and then somewhere you could find that post object that's deeply somewhere in your components, and you could set selected to true and like have that change. 
it's something you could do. Uh, and Ember data, I mean, you know, sometimes it is something we do do uh, on accident or on purpose. Uh, but, you know, I think we've found by now that two-way reactive patterns are usually not what we want. I think if you're doing like some D3 charting and you're dragging sliders and stuff's moving, it feels like it makes sense to me. And you know, got this whole reactive system going. But for most of the UIs we build, it's much more like users are kind of stepping through a workflow, right? They're setting up something, they're saving it, oh, validation error, go back. Uh, so it's usually not what we want to have these kind of uh, two-way bindings everywhere. And here's something I run into all the time that you might not think of as a data down actions up thing, but like let's say you want to make a new posts route, right? So you, you break out your Ember data, you get your store, you create this record, and then you just like send it down through your components into the abyss. And along the way, someone's like, it's marking it, it's filling stuff out. And then somewhere in your system, somebody's going to call post save. You don't know where, you don't know when, and you hope it's all going to work out. Uh, the alternative to that is, you know, we could maybe not pass that through and, and mutate it all the way. We could have our components build up the state that they have and start setting those actions up, bring them together, and then maybe only committing that record at the end. I mean, if anyone's you know, created a new record and then tried to get rid of that record, maybe when you deactivate the route, or maybe I need to filter out all the new records because now they're showing up in my list. Uh, if you've run into that problem, I think that's uh, something to give a try. Here's something else to try on. Maybe Let's look at these lifecycle hooks a little more and uh, not rely on computed properties as much. Uh, here's a computed property, you know, the canonical first name, last name uh, that you could set up with a computed property, but you could also use did receive adders. It's a little more explicit about when it's happening. You know, you're going to run into trouble if you're expecting that uh, you just pass in a model and you change its last name and then the component changes. So don't expect that to work, but maybe that's not a bad thing. Uh, the other thing I've been kind of trying on recently is thinking of my data in terms of sort of snapshots that happen throughout the system and get committed instead of sort of thinking about a model that's just getting changed as it works its way through my system. So services, just to wrap up, services are kind of like what everything else is not in a way. You've got routing and all the state is in the URL. You've got components and pretty much everything in there is on the page, like stuff you can see. And then services is kind of this pervasive sort of, you can't really see it stuff that's, that's there. So we've got these nested UIs, right? Like, all right, application, posts, show, nest your components, same thing, pass everything down. Uh, but for some components, it doesn't really make sense to pass everything down through your component hierarchy. Like if you've got a web socket, like why pass that through all my components? Messaging, why pass it if there's a session? I don't want to like pass that through every single route and every single component. So the way I teach this is we've got another way to pass this in without going through, and that's to do it internally uh, with ember.inject service. So it's another way to pass something into a component with dependency injection, uh, but it just kind of happens internally. So that's the, that's the quick, quick uh, overview of Ember. So I want to leave with a few things. Um, I think if you're new to Ember and you're learning Ember for some, from somebody, I mean, of course, you need to learn the syntax and all that stuff, but I, I guess I'd encourage you to ask the dumbest questions you can think of. Like, why can't I just do what I want to do? Why can't I just use equals? You know, why do I have to set all this stuff up? How is this different from just using jQuery and sending a class? That kind of stuff, because that's what like, builds your mental model. Why is this better? How is this different? If you're new, reading the guides is awesome. I read the components part of the guides recently and didn't realize it had been updated, uh, and it's really great. RFCs like the component unification uh, that there is talking about is great. Just to kind of think like, okay, why are we moving to adders and one-way binding? There's one up there right now called contextual components that just got merged like 20 minutes ago, uh, and that is that was really great to kind of see how you can compose po components. Um, that's one definitely to check out. And the last thing on there is to use other frameworks. I mean, reading about other frameworks is good, but using them is better. I know it's the like the the hardest thing to do because uh, it just takes so much time. But you know, you can think about why doesn't React have any observation in their components, and how does that make me feel? Why doesn't Angular need get and set, and how does that change the way I think about what I'm doing? If you're way into Ember, I love this pedagogy. That's just a fancy term for what we used to call getting learned in the Midwest. But uh, this is a really good example of in our RFC just including 
a mental model, right? When you use a component, it's replaced with its contents, which is exactly what we just saw up here. So just want to encourage that sort of thing. And if you are a teaching ember, you know, try to be really consistent with your mental models and try to be honest with your mental models. Don't pull a refrigerator on us. Uh, realize that teaching is going to hone your own skills and your own understanding. And be really empathetic because we're all learning embers. It's always continuously changing. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>